right now. What about now? What about now? All right. Life and the death we belong to God. Life.
with us this week. Uh, some announcements and prayer concerns. I hope you've seen. We've gotten some advertising going in the local paper. The, the story is that they lost the flyer, so they sent this in, and we'll go through the flyers as well. But, but keep an eye on your local paper and maybe stick it in your friend's neighbor's box, neighbor box if they don't get the paper uh, as we continue to try to grow our church and our ministry and our presence in the community. A couple of prayer requests. Uh, first, Susan's brother is not responding well to his latest round of chemo. He's really struggling. I know John is going to go visit him later in the week, but prayers for strength for him to continue this tough, tough battle with his cancer. Also, David let me know just before worship began that V is continuing to have difficulties, and she is actually in hospice care um, due to her continual dementia, seizures, and maybe some mini strokes, and he just wanted everyone to be aware. She, she's not in pain. She, she's feeling well uh, generally, but is as increasingly showing other signs, and, and, um, but, but wanted everyone to be aware and to keep her in prayer. She's still in the same location if you are able to reach out. I know you would love that. Are there other prayer concerns this day among God's people? Absolutely, continue to keep folks in, in prayers. Uh, there are lots of needs in this community and around the world for sure. Let us now turn our hearts and minds as we worship God with beginning by the lighting of the Advent candles this day. Over 100 people from, all, from the ages two to 80 years old were asked the question, what are you afraid of? From their voices of different generations, hear their answers. A college student said, not being enough. An adult said, not making enough of a difference. A child said, falling down. An older adult said that we will forget we belong to one another. A teenager said, climate change. A woman a child having to learn gun violence drills at school. A child said, fighters. An older adult said, not having someone to take care of me, not having someone who knows my story. A teenager said, my mental health slipping. A man said, ending up alone. A child said, nightmares. An older adult said, stopping short of following God all the way. Friends, today we light the candle of peace because we so desperately need God's peace in the midst of all we fear. May this candle be a reminder that Christ is coming. God was with generations before. God is with us today. And God will be with us tomorrow. This is the promise of God. He's joining the call to worship. We believe in God who knows our fears. We believe in God who says, do not be afraid. We believe in a God who kicks off our shoes and waves into the muck of our lives with us. We believe in a God who stitches himself to our heels and invites us to dance. We believe in a God who hymns stars into the night sky so that we can find our way home, and who sends us friends with open doors, so we can find our way to love. We believe in a God who finds in our fear 
and does not leave us alone. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Please join as you're able to sing hymn number 22, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Fear can be a good thing. It can help us be attentive while driving down the highway. It can alert us to possible accidents. It can motivate us to do our best. However, fear can also be harmful. For so many of us, fear of the other, fear of failure, or fear of the unknown has led us to make sinful, sinful choices in our lives. Choices such as, such as building walls or tearing others down. Today in confession, we ask for mercy and pray for guidance. As we confess, we come before an entirely merciful and loving God who says to us, do not be afraid. Let us pray. Please join in the unison prayer of confession. Patient God, you know just how often we make decisions from a place of fear rather than love. You know just how often we allow fear to take the place of logic. 
Fanny and healthy fires in our lives. You know just how often we tuck your words, do not be afraid, on a dusty shelf and in the back of our closets, stubbornly holding on to our own point of view. Forgive us for giving fear the microphone. Silence the voices of scarcity, shame, and rejection, which spark and feed so much of our fear to recenter us in love. We hope and pray. Please continue in silence. Assurance of pardon. Family of faith, even when we forget God's words, God does not forget us. Even when we lose our way, God does not lose us. Even when we fall short or make mistakes, God gives and holds on to us. We are known, forgiven, and loved. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, whether it's through angels or music, friendships or sermons, study or nature, when you speak, we long to hear it. In a world as chaotic and broken as ours, we could use your words of hope and healing. With gratitude, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give, you him, will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Our second scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jess, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With just he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. 
The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hands into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In that day, the root of Jess will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray now in this time and place that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our collective hearts might be acceptable in your sight, you, O oh God, who are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Christ, amen. So let's start this sermon with a story. Now, now, I thought about having all of you come down and sit with me under the Christmas tree for story time, but then I realized someone would have to come and help get some of us up, and, and, and it might make the news with, with stuff not like this, but with headlines like Presbyterians need a, a literal lift, or, or the frozen chosen have fallen and can't get up. So I decided to skip going underneath the tree. Plus, this really isn't a, a Twas Night Before Christmas or a Dr. Stoos or, or Berenstein Bears. You remember those old Berenstein Bears, don't you? It, it, it's a story a little bit closer to, to Edgar Allan Poe, you might say. So here we go, once upon a time. Oh, I meant to get Sydney to dim the lights when I said once upon a time. It's, it's okay, don't worry about it. These folks don't need any other reason to doze off. Anyway, once upon a time, dust had fallen and darkness had fully engulfed the city. The young woman was running late and heading to her home, the night air was heavy and the streets were unusually quiet. She walked down the streets, deftly moving a path she had taken many times before. She carried her goods to the market, the same she had done thousands of times. different. Even the night birds and crickets were clearly different. She slipped inside her small home. Her parents were adjacent, their home just next door. But even their home had an extra small light coming from it. No one yelled out the window, hello. with them. She was sure she was just being silly. She was a young woman now. After all, she would be married soon. She went inside her dark, dank home. The fire she had left burning had gotten low. Just, just embers left. It needed stoking. She said her down on the small table. She thought she heard something. It must have just been in her mind. She saw nothing and turned towards the fire, shaking her head while still looking at the heat. In the barely glowing embers of the fire, she reached down when suddenly there was crack, crack like a thunder, and the room exploded in a strange glow. Her 
heart raced. She started to sweat, and she would have screamed had she could have breathed. Something in the shadows rattled, shadows rattled out the words, greetings, favored one. God is with you. She trembled in fear, and the creature, sensing her fear, declared, be not afraid. And Mary thought to herself, that ship had sailed long ago. How many of you in my reading the story felt your own heart quicken just a little bit? Maybe your palms got sweaty. Maybe you were worried the preacher had really gotten a hold of Stephen King and forgotten the scripture lesson. Now, I know back in the 1970s, the Sunday school book I grew up with depicted that young, college-age-looking girl, obedient in joyful prayer as an angel came down, like he was invited. The, the house was immaculate. Dusting had been done everywhere. The angel was right there. She had a warm smile on her face like she was just expecting an, an angel to drop by. I'll be honest with you. I think my account may be just as accurate or maybe more so. I mean, this visitor, the Bible says, was Gabriel, was not expected or invited and obviously scared the stew out of Mary. An angel visits me, I think I'm going to be scared. The Greek word that the, 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 the NIV says made bewildered, it, it really is more than that. It was afraid. Mary was afraid. And Gabriel, sensing that his plan of, of greetings favored one God is with you wasn't going over so well, followed up with the famous words, do not be afraid. You know, we see Mary being, being the one that is, is revered now as, as the mother of Jesus and we forget that Mary was human. And we humans, we humans, in, in the bottom line, are, are, are governed by an almond-shaped portion of our brain called the amygdala. I've mentioned it in a sermon before. It's that caveman, fight-or-flight, reptilian part of the brain that helps us know when danger might be present. We're all familiar with this part of the brain. We, we've all felt fear at one time or another. Sometimes it, it's rational. Sometimes there's a rational need for fear. But other times, other times we get afraid even when we know the fears are unfounded. How many of you have ever bought a ticket and gone to one of those those horror movies, or, 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 or a movie that's intense in its plot. You bought the ticket. You know it's not real. You got a general idea of the premise. You're not visiting It's a Small World, the movie. And yet we jump or scream or hide our eyes when something pops out to surprise us or the curtain to the bathroom it, it is open there in the shower. We know what's going to happen. We paid good American money to have that appear. Yes, we humans are fear-filled people. Most psychologists will tell you that the emotion that drives the majority of our decision-making is fear. It's certainly not optimism, and, and it's not even love. There was a couple that, that I knew that, that was obviously in love. I mean, sickeningly in love. You, you, you've seen those kind of couples, right? And, and I asked them, I said, when are y'all going to get engaged and get married? They said, oh, we're going to wait. We're going to wait till we're not afraid of that idea anymore. 
I said, then you're never going to get married. Because love and marriage, they have fear. They always will. Of course, politicians and advertisers and the media capitalize on this. Advertisements focus on fear in lots of ways. They they do it in, in all kinds of ways, even opposite ways. They'll say save and hoard because danger is around the corner. Bull markets don't last forever. The bear is coming. Recession is always around the corner. I mean, you think about it. A few years back, fear. Fear drove people to take their pickup trucks to the food city and fill the back of them with toilet paper. Toilet paper. We're told to believe in scarcity, even of toilet paper, and certainly not believe in God's abundance. I mean, God's promise of abundance is good poetry, but we live in nonfiction, real-life prose. Of course, the opposite of those advertisements are also true. A way to deal with fear is is that, well, you know, death is always just around the corner, so live it up now because you won't get the opportunity. You can't take it with you, so live crazy. We're not promised tomorrow, so, so take care and live in the moment. Don't care about anyone but you and yours. Drink it, smoke it, shoot it up. Whatever you have to do, party now, jump off the mountain without a parachute that you know is going to work because the one with the best adrenaline rushes and the most fantastic experiences, they win, not the ones that have hoarded all the toys. Oh, advertisers love to play on our fears. Of course, fear makes us ignore facts. For example, the truth is statistically, statistically serious violent crime and even most other crimes are way down. But you look at the recent TV news and and advertisements, you would think that Al Capone was back and his gang was running every town in America. Now, I'm not saying gun violence isn't a scourge on our society, but I am saying I think it is okay most days to go to your mailbox without bulletproof armor and a semi-automatic weapon at your side, regardless of what the TV and politicians say. And yes, while school shootings are indeed a blight, on our nation. The fact is that statistically, schools are the safest place for kids in the United States to be. The biggest threats and actual harm happening in children is because of childhood poverty and the lack of health care and subpar schools with teachers who have to work two and three jobs or classrooms that are simply filled with substitutes because they can't find qualified folks. And as far as the politicians are concerned, they show up at places like that or hospitals that that lack staff or photo ops and press conferences while never actually going inside a school or an assisted living facility or hospital. Instead, they simply make rules and laws because they know better. Just cut the funding and make them work harder. And let's be sure we test them and and, and be sure we keep up with data and statistics. Doesn't matter whether we know anything or not. And this, this fear means that we ignore the complex issues because we're pointed towards things like violence. It isn't as real a fear as hunger in a community. It isn't as real a fear as inadequate health care in the community that isn't as real a fear as prison reform and helping those who get out of prison reintegrate in society. 
And instead of coming together to work towards solving those problems, people put on fears that, that want us to push others away, protect mine, see others as different so that we can be safe as if as humans we are ever fully safe. We're frail beings. But this fear keeps us from making sure kids have food and seniors have companionship and medical care and young people have the promise of a living wage and even teachers don't have to go to Office Depot and buy their own supplies. Now we're as guilty of it as society. We fear things, even things we shouldn't fear. We fear aging. How many of you have, have ever seen a commercial for anti-aging cream? I will not say that there may or may not be some that I have seen in folks' bathrooms. Anti-aging cream. We're afraid we might look our age. I even know people get their hair colored. Certainly don't want to show any gray. Yeah, I'm going from preaching to meddling. I'll be quiet now, honey. Perhaps we could look at, at our age like I'm trying to now as a badge of honor, not something to be afraid of. Of course, do you know what's top on some of the Christmas lists this year? Security systems. We're scared to death of somebody breaking into our home. We want to be able to monitor it 24-7. We, we got these things on our, our doorbells so we can see people walking up. Of course, then we also worry that we're not liked, right? So, so we don't worry about cyber crime, which is actually a crime that's growing. Instead, we share all our information right out there on Facebook, including what we eat. If my brother-in-law is listening, I really don't need a picture of your hamburger from lunch every day. Of course, even the church gets in the fear business. The church is prone to scare folks into the faith. I've been there. I've heard the preacher say, you come down, be saved now, or eternal damnation awaits. You better give this much if you want to be sure you get into the kingdom of God. You better believe this and dress like this. Love who we say you should love. Vote like we tell you to vote or you're out of the kingdom and damnation awaits. Fear can govern our actions. We're motivated by it. How many of you remember Herbert Hoover? Herbert Hoover, you know, he was the, the, the leader of the FBI. He, he brought fear to criminals and many who weren't criminals. But I wonder if you know this about Herbert Hoover. During his life, he was in a pretty bad car accident. His driver was taking a left, and somebody ran a stop sign and hit him. After that, Herbert Hoover was terrified of left-hand turns. He would not allow his driver to make a left-handed turn to go anyway, anywhere. They had to map out an alternative route instead of right-hand turns after right-hand turns, even if it meant taking a five-minute drive and turning it into a 45-minute labyrinth. Oh, we have all kinds of phobias. The lady next door to me, she's scared to death of spiders. If I hear a scream, it means I got to go and get a spider out of there. I got one teacher who's scared to death of snakes. She was on the backfield last week or a couple of weeks ago, actually, and a snake was down there. You would have think the world had ended when she was screaming over the walkie-talkie like the snake didn't live there and, and she didn't. Some folks fear being alone. Some folks fear being in crowds and the list of fears go on and on. And Mary. Mary was scared by the angel Gabriel appearing. And then old Gabriel gave another terrifying message. He says, don't be afraid. But then hear what he says next. 
God is going to make you pregnant, or as we good church folks say, great with child. That, that still means pregnant, by the way. Mary was unmarried. She was young. She was lower middle class at best, and she was pregnant. And the only explanation she could give her parents or her fiancé was that an angel had visited. The law. The law said Joseph could have her dragged out in public and stoned. Did she have reason to be afraid? Better believe it. So what kept Mary from being paralyzed by fear? And what also might help us in a world dominated by fears, both real ones and imagined ones? Well, we're called Gabriel says to Mary, be not afraid. But then he goes on. He goes on to, to answer the question I'm sure Mary had. It's the question all children have, especially when you tell them something. The question is this, why? Go clean your room, why? Why do I need to make my bed every morning? It's bedtime, why? We're good with those why questions, aren't we? Mary couldn't even get out, why should I not be afraid? Gabriel says, do not be afraid. Because the Lord is with you. Think of that a minute. An amazing statement. God, God not only knows, but is with this peasant girl who is in essence a nobody. She's a single female in an occupied land, a land that is driven by patriarchy, and money. And yet God doesn't only know her, God is with her. God doesn't just say, I'll be with you. Give me a call if you need me. Here's my cell phone number. You can even text. No, the God of the universe who made galaxies and stars and oceans and even the mysteries of the atoms. And not just protons and neutrons, I found out, and electrons, but, but they're quarks and quarks and nanoparticles. The God of all of that mystery and complexity knows Mary and is with her and is with us. And in order to demonstrate that commitment to us, God sends God's Son through Mary to demonstrate God's commitment to be with you and I. This idea of God's commitment, it's something I struggled with. I, I wrestled with this week as I was writing this sermon. Preachers, preachers, we're good at standing up here and telling you, you need to be committed to the Lord. You need to be committed to the church. We're, we're really good at it at stewardship sign. Be sure to turn in your commitment card if you haven't already done so. The thing about commitment is we do not as humans make commitments to things unless we believe they are committed to us. For example, in a marriage, I doubt if anyone would continue the service if during the vows, the bride or the groom said, when asked, do you, they said, well, maybe. I don't know, perhaps. Is there an opt-out clause? I mean, a nervous I do is okay, but a, well, is this sort of like a lease? You know, after six years, I can trade it. I guess I am. God is committed to us and demonstrates that commitment by promising to be with us in good times and bad. Perhaps my favorite words from all the epistles are found in Romans 8, 38, 39, where the writer so powerfully declares, for I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is what Gabriel promises Mary in his frightening visit and his troubling words. Mary, God is with you. It's not just that God is around and will be available, but God is with you. Now, often in the Christmas pageant production, the next thing we get after after Gabriel right here is is Mary breaking into her magnificence. You know, that, that's normally what we get. We, we don't want to go through the whole story. We want, we want to at least try to beat the Methodist out for lunch. But there's a lot more here, isn't there? Mary doesn't just accept these words, even if they are for an angel. Mary, well, she has questions. She sounds a lot like you and me. Seems we always have questions for God in, in times of, of joy and especially in times of sorrow. For Mary, it took actually visiting Elizabeth and being comforted by another before she could sing those words of joy. Yes, yes, she told that angel she was willing. But to me, it seems she was sort of a reluctant servant. Any of you ever been a reluctant servant? I know I have. I know I've often thought, Lord, I'll do it, but surely there is somebody better or more qualified. I thought of this a a few years ago, and I remember something from a few years ago. A few years ago, I was asked to officiate my first funeral by myself. Now, Now, I'm in my 40s. I shouldn't be nervous about things like this. I'm now in my 50s, but I was in my 40s back then, and and I was asked to officiate a funeral by myself. I I had read poems and and, and prayers and scripture and and done a little bit of eulogy in a few funerals, but suddenly I was solo on my own. I hadn't asked for that. I I know there are preachers who who go by wedding chapels like the one Margaret has and leaves their card. They leave them at the court, you know, a house clerk. If anybody wants to get married, I'd love to do the service. Preachers don't do that for funerals. We try to put our number in unlisted in those cases. When I got the message, I got it by voicemail. I was at school. I thought, well, I'll call back at the end of the day. Maybe they'll have found somebody more qualified by then. They did not. Alas, it was my calling. And finally, I had to say, like Mary, here I am. Do with me as you will. And what I realized after the service was over and I was driving home, that although I was unsure of myself and And at the time, I accepted this a little more than annoyed with God that he didn't give this call to someone else, especially as I was trying to put together words of comfort for a grieving family, that just like God's promise to be with that grieving family was true, God's promise to be with me, helping walk that grieving family through the process, was true. See, I find as good news in this text, if I understand it, that even when we struggle in our commitment to God, God remains committed fully to you and I. And while sometimes God sends us to dangerous places, often we know we put ourselves in bad places with mistakes and poor decisions. In such cases, when we mess up, God is still with us. Think of Jonah. Jonah had to get thrown off a ship and swallowed by a whale. God was there. 
God forgave Thomas who doubted, Peter who denied, even called Paul who persecuted Christians. By the world's standards, by the world's standards, God should have given up on each of those. I know he should have given up on me. But because our creator is a God of love, God stays with us even when we try to hide or push God away. Even in our doubts and fear, God remains with us and sits with us. And in so doing, we are comforted and given hope. And with this hope and the love of God and God's people, we can give God praise and consider a new day. This praise is not because God has taken away the pain. I wish I could tell you that that's what God did. God takes away pain. No, what God promises is to be with you in that pain. Even in our struggling and our doubt, God sits with us to give us that courage that doesn't take fear away, but walks with us to our fear. Such courage allowed the prophets and Mary and the disciples and you and I to imagine a day unlike any other where the promised day of the kingdom of God will exist, everything will be turned upside down and made right, and fear will be no more. Isaiah describes this day where there will be no more fear in this way. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and lion, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand into the viper's nest but they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. In Isaiah's vision, which is brought into reality through a shoot that rises up from the stump of Jesse, God's spirit will intervene, leading to a world of righteousness and peace. Prey will no longer fear their predators, The vulnerable will be protected. Pain will be no more. And all of God's creation will be filled with the wisdom and knowledge of God. The tough question. The tough question we are asked to consider is where do you and I see glimpses of that vision coming to And how can we support them? What I'm saying is, what actions can we take today to help fulfill this prophecy into fruition for our generation and generations to come? How can we live as a people who, in spite of our fears, find hope and live with peace that God is with us in life and in death? This is part of the call we as followers of Christ are to consider in this Advent season. Last week, last week, if you'll recall, we we lit the candle of hope. This week, we lit the candle of peace. Friends, it's only those with hope that can even imagine peace, and it is only those who believe that God is with us even in our pain and fearful moments that we can not only acknowledge the possibility of peace, but praise God for his commitment to us. So in this season, in this season when the world wants to point us to all the bad news and all the reasons we should be afraid, may we seek to walk with courage because we know that God is with us. We are told not to be afraid. And it's not because there aren't scary things, but because God is with us. And to demonstrate that, he sent his only begotten son, born in a manger, 
child who would grow up to conquer evil and death so that we might live in peace, knowing of God's unending and unfailing love, a love which we remember at the table we'll visit in just a few minutes. Oh, Lord, be to God for that great love he has for you. In the name of the Father, of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we do believe. Help our unbelief in Christ. Amen. Friends, having heard the good news and the good news proclaimed, let us confess that which we believe using the Apostles' Creed found printed on the inside cover of your hymnal. As you are able, let us stand and say that which we believe together. Friends, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. God gives out of God's abundance. Let us respond to God's generosity with our own abundant giving.
Will you join me in the unison prayer of dedication? Let us pray. God of mercy, accept these gifts and multiply them for Christ's mission of love and grace for all the world. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Friends, you were invited to this table not because you must, but because you may. Friends, this is not the Presbyterian table. It's the table of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all are welcome. All are welcome in spite of all of our fear. You come to the table. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, I pray that you take these very simple, simple elements, the bread, the juice, and bless them. Bless them so that we might be reminded of your love and commitment to us. We ask in your son's holy name. Amen. Friends, on the night our Lord was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and after finishing the meal, he gathered around the table, and he took a piece of bread, and after giving thanks, he said, this, this bread is my body, broken for you. Eat, do this in remembrance of me. In a likewise manner, he also took the cup, and after giving thanks again, he said, this cup, this cup contains my blood shed for you. Drink, drink, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God given for you. You, the beloved children of God, you come to the table. Let us pray. Holy God, we take a deep breath in and know that you are here. For where two or more are gathered, you are there. You never leave our sight. Like a protective mother hen or the sun who circles the earth, you carry us with you. 
So today, we bow our heads with tender spirits and ask that once more you would lean in close. Hear our prayers. Buoy our hearts. Send your spirit rushing through us like a mighty wind. For these days, God, we have much to fear. We fear the return of a COVID variant that could once again shut down the world. We fear the rising tide of violence. We fear global warming. Will our grandchildren have trees to climb? We look at our own lives and are afraid that we aren't making much of a difference, that we might be forgotten at the end of the day. We fear rejection. We fear grief. We fear not being enough. Holy God, the muck of our lives is deep. At times, it feels like we're swimming in it. And so we come to you today because you are a God who said, do not fear, 365 times in Scripture, once for every day. You are a God who has inserted yourself into the corners of our lives, refusing to let us go, refusing to leave us alone. And so we rest in that. We empty our pockets of our fears and give them to you, trusting that you will hold them tenderly, just as you hold us. You whisper, be not afraid. You promise to never leave our side. You call us beloved. May that be enough for today. And now, with hope in our hearts, we pray the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number two, no, 16. Uh, the angel came. Um, we're going to sing the first and fourth verses. Friends, as you leave this place, may you go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you, and calls you forth, saying, go, be the person you were called to be. Love wildly. Do justice and come back soon. 
May it be so, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.